Hey guys, thank you so much for watching us on YouTube. My name is Eddie Vargas. I'm the lead pastor of Restoration Life. We pray that as you watch these messages that they become a blessing to you and your family. If you'd like to come and visit us, just make sure that you click down on the link below. Visit us at restoration-life.com. We'd love to meet you. God bless you. Hope this message blesses you. Hey, can I just welcome some of our uh, European sisters from Europe, Scotland, and England in the house today. It's an honor to have you guys with us. Uh, I, honey, I told her that you've been wanting to go to Scotland. I told her to stay away from you. <laughs> uh, hey, welcome. It's good to have you with us today. If you have your Bibles open in Matthew 25, I'm going to attempt uh, to close off our letter or the <laughs> The, uh, here comes the Bride series today um, with some very important uh, truths and some pretty serious warnings from Jesus. And um, this isn't the kind of message that you'll always hear uh, every Sunday throughout the Christian world. But I do think that this is a truth that I think that everybody always needs to have on their heart and in their mind because I think it'll bring an urgency to everything that we say and everything that we do. And this is the one thing that I want to say to you right now. Jesus is coming for his bride. Jesus, one day, is going to come back for his bride. And the bride is the church. And who is the church? We are the church, which means that Jesus is coming back for us. With that understanding, there are a lot of things that are that are that are difficult sometimes to grasp, but there are truths that we need to learn and we need to live by in order to understand the urgency of the time that we're in when it comes to that very statement, Jesus is coming back. And somebody would say that, well, Jesus has been coming back for 2,000 years now. That is a, is a truth, but he's never been closer to coming back than today. And so um, for us this morning, I've entitled this message, uh, Here Comes the Groom. Here Comes the Groom. In this series, we've learned um, a lot of powerful truths. One of the most powerful truths I think that we've learned in this series is that you can't say that you love Jesus and hate his church. You can't say that you love Jesus and that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and not be an active member of the body of Christ, which the Bible describes as his bride. That we've been called to be the church and not just go to church, right? Right? That God has been merciful to us. Is that, has God been merciful to you guys? That God has been merciful to us and that as Christians, as the bride of Christ, as the body of Christ, we are to be merciful to, to each other and to everyone else in the world, that, that, that we are to love people into God's house and not judge them out of the church, right? We talked about how everybody here is, is an important and vital part of the bride of Christ, and we talked about how we are all gifted, and God gave us those gifts um, for his purpose and for his plan, and so there are a lot of biblical truths that we spent the last six or seven weeks, uh, learning about and studying and hopefully growing. And today, again, I've entitled this message, Here Comes the Bridegroom, because Jesus is coming for his bride. Does anybody remember, those of you that are married, do you remember when you guys got engaged? Remember what, when you got engaged, how excited you were about getting married? Forget all the drama and, and all the other stuff that came along with it, but the idea of entering into a brand new life, into a brand new relationship into, with the person that you love. And when you think about this message and you think about the message of Jesus, you can't help but see God see himself as the groom and the church, his bride. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25. And I'm going to start reading with verse number 1. And we're going to read a lot in the Bible today because, as you've heard me say before, no one can preach like the Bible preaches, right? So Matthew 25, 1 starts saying this, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins 
who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming. And so they all became drowsy and fell asleep. The first, the first thing that I want you to notice this morning is that, that the bridegroom was coming back for his bride. He told her that he's coming back for her. And that these ten virgins had a job to do. Okay? One job. Stay ready and keep watch. Everybody say, stay ready and keep watch. That was their job. You only have one job. Be ready and keep watch. And the Bible says that the bridegroom was a long time in coming. In other words, it's been taking a long time for him to come. And the Bible says that they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, here comes the groom. Here comes the bride's groom. Here comes the groom. Come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. They got them started. And the foolish one said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil. Our lamps have gone out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know who you are. Therefore, what does it say? Keep watch. Stay ready and keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour that he's coming. Let's bow our heads as we go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for everyone that's in this house this morning. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. God, we want to stay ready, and we want to keep watch. We don't want to grow weary in well-doing. We don't want to miss out on your return. We want to be an active, living member of the body of Christ that you call your bride. Because when you come back for her, you're coming back for us. And so, God, I pray, have your way this morning. Invade this place In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can somebody make some noise and give God some some praise? Just let me let me just give you a little bit of context and what's going on here. Matthew chapter 25 is pigtailing what's taken place in Matthew chapter 4. We don't have a whole lot of time to go through everything that we'll read in Matthew chapter 24. I am gonna highlight some things to get you to understand how we're going to land this thing in Matthew chapter 25 with the story of the ten virgins. Now, I've never, to my remembrance, and I don't have a great memory, but I can never really remember ever really preaching on the parable of these ten virgins. But it's a very interesting story. And the more you study it out, the more you learn about it, and the more depth that you you understand within this story, the more that you'll see that Jesus really presents himself throughout the Bible as the groom that's coming back for his bride. And the way that he presents the story and the way that he teaches the people in that period of time is through, a, through communicating um, in, in the terms that they understand that has to do with a traditional Jew, Jewish wedding. And so back in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus got some pretty, pretty hard things that he's saying, and it's a, both a terrible and amazing time. It's terrible for people that don't know Jesus, but it's amazing for everybody who's accepted him as Lord and Savior. And in Matthew 24, 30, he says this. Then, and he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the end of days. He's talking about when the end will come, the things that will happen before he comes. 
the Bible says, then will, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet sound or a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And so Jesus is talking about a period of time, a time that will come where we already know that he's already come the first time. The first time that he came, he came to seek and to save the lost. And aren't you glad that he did? Right? He came to die on a cross, to raise again from the grave, so that whosoever believes in him can't, would not perish but have everlasting life. We understand this. We know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So that we can come into a right relationship with God the Father. We understand that. We know that he came to destroy the works of the devil. We get that. That was his first coming. But the Bible declares and Jesus declares that he is coming back for his bride. And his bride is made up of saints, people that have been washed by the blood of Jesus, people that have repented from the sin and have built a relationship with God, people that were once jacked up and broken and messed up and are en route to being completely and totally restored and experiencing the grace of God throughout their lives. But on the day that God comes back for them, he, they are going to be ready to be called up for a meeting in the air. He is coming back for his bride. Listen, could you imagine what that would look like? Could you imagine you're on a plane, you're saved, you're in love with God, and right there and then, boom, Jesus comes back for his bride, and all kinds of people are gone, and yet others will remain. You're in the house, making tamales, doing whatever you do. Some in your house go, some in your house remain. You're at work. People start disappearing left and right. Some go, some stay. Have you ever thought what that day might look like when Jesus returns for his bride? In verse 40 of Matthew chapter 24, the Bible says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. Sounds like she's making tortillas. Anyways, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, what does it say? What does it say? Keep watch. Look at somebody and tell them, keep watch. Because you don't know the day or the hour that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. So this isn't a message that you would normally hear on a Sunday morning but it is definitely a message that needs to resonate throughout our Christianity. We are preparing for the day that Jesus Christ comes back for his bride. Church, you and I need to know that one day, Jesus is coming back for you. The rapture will take place. The bride will be reunited with the bridegroom. And this heavenly wedding ceremony will take place in heaven. And I don't want you to be that person that knows about the wedding, that has known about the wedding, and, and, and when somebody asks you, hey, are you going with us to this wedding ceremony? Hey, are you going to heaven? You respond like a lot of people do sometimes. They go, I didn't get the invitation. I wasn't invited. Let me tell you this morning that Jesus is your invitation. Jesus is inviting you by what he did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is your invitation to that heavenly wedding ceremony that one day will take place. That is why God sent his son, so that you and I could be united as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, to be, to be uh, 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 brought together with what the Bible or with who the Bible declares is the bridegroom. Romans chapter 6, verse 5, out of the Passion Translation, it reads it like this. For since we are permanently, I love that. For since we are permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his, 
then we are permanently grafted into him to experience a resurrection like his and the new life that he imparts. I think to understand Matthew chapter 25, this parable of the virgins, we have to do a little bit of a study on what a traditional Jewish wedding was like. Number one, the first thing that they would come into is a covenant agreement or a contract. Actually, it would be more of a contract until something happens later. The Hebrew word for what they do is called the ketubah. So first, what you need to know is that the parents play a major role in choosing the spouse for their son. How many moms would be like, hey, put, sign me up for that? Right? The parents played a major role in choosing the bride. Now, the son could tell the parents who he wanted to marry, but it was the parents that gave him the authority to go and marry her. Even more so, they would go with him to ask for the permission to marry the other family's daughter. So then the man would leave his father's house and go with his father and with his mom and go to the woman's house and offer her this marriage contract called the ketubah. Now, there would be, they would negotiate a price. They, call, they had this thing called the bride price. Everybody say the bride price. The bride price was um, something that was placed on the bride for what she was worth, for instance. So he would go to the dad of the, of the bride and negotiate the bride price. In the Hebrew, the word is mohar, but that's literally what it means, the bride price. And if the bride price was, was high, it was because the bridegroom, the man that wanted to marry the girl, saw a lot of value in her, and he honored her and really loved her. And so the expense that was placed on the bride price was, was, was something that declared his love, his value, and how much he honored her. Now, the bride price was often high because women back in that day were regarded as an expense more than an asset. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that if I want to live through the night. <laughs> so, so back then, women in general were looked upon as more as an expense. They were very expensive. I think they kind of still are. Not mine, but in general. And the reason why they were looked upon as an expense was because back then, most women were not allowed to work. They couldn't go tend the fields, and they couldn't go harvest grain. And, not, and I know the American woman can. I'm just saying back then, they weren't allowed to. And they wouldn't. They would stay at home in chanclas and a T-shirt, I'm just kidding. They would stay at home and take care of the house. And so their value was based on how much the bridegroom loved her, how much he valued her, and how much he honored her. But she was looked upon as more of an asset. So this was, again, something that was very traditional 2,000 years ago. So the bride price was also meant to compensate the father for the cost of raising the daughter. Did you know that today they say that to raise children up until the time that they get married, um, if they get married in their 20s, that you've probably spent close to a million dollars raising that child. And so for those of you that have more than one daughter, wouldn't it be awesome for somebody to go, I'll give you a million right now? Because back then... It was the groom's family that paid for everything, not the daughter's family. And, and, and any dads in the house with daughters, you can say amen to that. But, but here's the reality. The reality is, is that the groom would come and suggest the bride price, and they would negotiate this with the dad, the bride's dad. 
So again, this gave honor to the family, honor to the bride, and the groom expressed how much love he actually had for her. Now, this is what you need to see as a parallel when Jesus declares himself as the bridegroom and the church his bride. Excuse me, we know that Christ left heaven to come to the earth to give his life as a ransom and to pay the bride price so that he can come into a relationship with us. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says it this way, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Peter the apostle says it this way, for you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life handed down from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold which eventually perishes, but it was paid with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who like a spotless, unblemished blemished lamb was sacrificed for us. So get the picture. What higher price can any bridegroom pay for the bride except lay down his own life to bring himself into a right relationship with her. Are you hearing me? In fact, Paul the Apostle writes to the church in Ephesus, I believe, and he says, husbands, love your wives. How much? The way that Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? He died for her. He paid the ultimate price for his bride. Can anybody say amen? And so in Jewish tradition, the man would then pour a glass of wine, and give it to the woman. If she accepted the contract, if the father of the bride accepted the contract and he gave her permission, then she would drink of the cup, which would seal the contract, making the, the marriage complete and legally binding. This is a part of the Jewish tradition. And so in this time, there was no consummation of the marriage, which means they didn't have sex. He didn't take her away to live with him because he had to prepare some things first. But from that moment on, from the moment she received and agreed to the contract, when she agreed to the contract and drank from the wine, a new covenant was made. She was now coming into oneness or relationship to her husband. Is everybody following me so far? Watch this. She was considered from that moment on consecrated or set apart or sanctified exclusively for her husband. Do you remember when Joseph and Mary were betrothed to each other, right? They were engaged to one another. And then she found herself pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Do you guys remember that? When he found her pregnant with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says instead of, you know, putting her out in front of everybody and having her being stoned to death, basically he said that he would put her away. By putting her away meant that he was going to take care of her in private, that nobody would see her or know what was going on. And he was doing that to protect her because he didn't want her to be harmed by the law or by anybody. And so this was a period of engagement. They weren't married as of yet, but they were engaged to one another. And being engaged back then meant that you were consecrated and already married, although you didn't consummate the marriage by having sex. Everybody tracking with me? This is important when you, when you understand the parable of the ten virgins and everything else that Jesus talks about when he says that he's coming back for his bride. First Corinthians chapter 12 puts it this way. In writing you this letter addressed to the community of God throughout the city of Corinth, for you have been made pure, you are what? Set apart in the anointed one, in the anointed one Jesus, and God has invited you to be his devoted and holy people, and not only you, but everyone everywhere who calls on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and ours also. So from the moment, hey, is Max, where's Max? Is Pastor Max here? Pastor Max, can you bring me that, that stool? Thanks. My back is done. Um, if, from the moment that you receive Jesus Christ 
as your personal Lord and Savior. You guys tracking with me? Thank you. Can you roll that up for me? From the moment that you receive him as personal Lord and Savior, and he becomes God to you, and you have repented from your sin, and now you belong to him, from that moment on, you have been consecrated or set apart for a purpose and a time. Thank you. With that, you take communion, which is declared by Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 26, and he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, and he said, drink all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. So this is the new covenant that you're in, and now you've been set apart and sanctified with a purpose and for a time. Everybody tracking? This new covenant that we drink is a new covenant contract that Jesus purchased with his very own life. This was part of his bride price for the church. And now we all belong to Jesus. Can anybody say amen? Not only do we belong to Jesus, but we're set apart, we're sanctified, we have a purpose, God's got a plan and we are exclusively Christ's own. We, not when we die, not when we go to heaven, not when we're raptured, not later, but from the very moment you accepted Jesus Christ, you belong to God. You are a part of the family of God. You are on your way to heaven. You've been set apart. You've been sanctified. You've got a divine purpose. And one day Jesus, the groom, is coming back for his bride. Look at somebody and tell them, I belong to Jesus. But how can that be if he hasn't come back for me yet? Well, he's made a new covenant with us, and so he's, the contract's already been made. But watch this. In Jewish tradition, from the moment that she drank the wine, and she said, I do, I accept, and he purchases her, with the bride price, basically what happens is that there is a time of separation. This is so cool. There's a time of separation. We would call it the engagement time, but even in, in westernized culture, the engagement time doesn't mean that you're married, right? It means that you could still call it off, right? I mean, it would suck, but you would still be able to call it off. But Back then, from the moment that she agreed and he paid the bride price and she drank the wine, from that moment on, they were considered married. Okay? From that moment, he would leave her with her father, he'd leave her, and basically would go back to his father's house to build her something called the bridal chamber. Or the honeymoon chamber. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is a place that they would consummate the marriage and spend the next seven days of their marriage in. Hallelujah. I think me and Roxanne spent 14 days in the bridal. No, I'm just kidding. So, I'm just kidding. 14 days in the bridal chamber. Uh, but the bridal chamber is in his father's house. Listen to this. He would leave his bride, his wife, with her family, and he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for us. And he would go back to his father's house where there were many rooms, and he would make sure that the bridal chamber was perfect and was extravagant and had every necessity fulfilled for his wife. Check this out. That period of time would be around a year or so. And again, this would be the time that we would consider the engagement, but they would already be considered married. Now watch this. In Jewish custom, 
back then, in the days that Jesus is, is talking about these parables, um, the son could not go and get his bride whenever he wanted to. The son had to wait on the father's yes to go back and get his bride. Why? Because he wasn't allowed to skimp out on any of the work, and he had to get the father's approval before the father said that he was ready to go receive his bride. If anyone asked the son, hey, we know that you got married. We know that she drank the wine. We know that you paid the bride price. If anybody asked the son, hey, when are you going to go get her? The son's response would be, I don't know. Nobody knows. Only my father knows. Mark chapter 13, verse 31. Jesus teaches and he says this when asked, hey, when is this all going to happen? The end of days. When is all this going to take place? This is the response of Jesus. The earth and the sky will wear out and fade away before one word I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. Concerning that day and exact hour, what does it say? When it will arrive. Not the angels of heaven, not even the sun. What does he say? Only the Father knows. This is why you must be waiting, watching, and praying, because no one knows when that season of time will come. Is, there, is anybody catching any of this? After everything was ready, after the bridegroom would have everything ready, he would send his groomsmen to go announce the arrival of the bridegroom. He would have them go and blow the shofar, or in today's translation, a trumpet sound for the arrival of the groom coming to receive his bride. Now, on the day or night that he would arrive, the bride would have her bridesmaids go out into the streets and wait for the bridegroom to come. Usually the bridegroom would love to come at night. That's why they had the lamps with the oil. That's why they had to keep them ready because usually, customarily, they would come at night. Remember, there are no street lights and they would have like these torches and they would light the way for the bridegroom to come and receive his bride. The bridesmaids would keep the oil in their lamps full and they would be ready. And he, he can do this again at any time. And, and, and the bride would make special arrangements for his arrival. So it was the custom for the bride herself to keep her lamp filled with oil so she can burn brightly at night, and she would have her, her veil and her, the other things beside her bed that he would send her in advance. The bridesmaids were also waiting because they would also return with the groomsmen. Now, when the wedding party would arrive at the, at the house, what would happen is that they would go off into this seven-day party. Imagine, right? We usually just... It's like, it's like, hey, we'll see you at the reception, you know, a couple hours later, and it's done like around midnight. This party went on for seven days. They knew how to party. The groom's best friend would go back with the groom and station himself outside of the bridal chamber, you know, the Bao Chica Wow Wow room, and he would stay there until they came out. And when they came out as, as a symbol of the consecration of the marriage and of her giving up her virginity to her husband, there would be bloodstains, of course, on the sheet, and they would grab the sheep and, and they would celebrate it as a blood covenant. Imagine that. They would celebrate it as a blood covenant. She was holy. She was pure, and she came into a blood covenant with her groom. Are you, are you tracking with me so far? The proof 
was in this first experience of, of, of sexual intercourse in the bridal chamber. Now, this is important for two reasons. Number one, it speaks of purity before marriage. Come on. It speaks of staying holy and pure before you give yourself into a blood covenant with someone that you're going to become one with. I would encourage you, if you don't plan on becoming one with that someone, to keep yourself holy and pure for the day that the one would come and prepare everything and give himself totally for you. Right? It's not even in my notes. It's just a little side note, okay? Then all the friends then would really start to party after the seven days, and this is, this is the thing that we all have to take into account. This, this groom left everything and everyone to go and prepare a place for his bride. John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3 says this. There is, a, there is more than enough room in my father's house or in my father's home. If it were not so, I would have told you. What does Jesus say? I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. This is Jesus talking in these marital terms, helping everyone understand that even though he has to go away for a period of time, he's preparing everything for his return to come and sweep the bride up off her feet and take her back to that place where the wedding ceremony is consummated and finally celebrated in heaven when we're all together, amen, in one place. Come on. This is, this is amazing. So the question is this. If you and I represent the bride of Christ, are you ready for him to come back for you? Are you ready for his return? Are you ready? What do you mean by that? Because not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, not everybody that says, I go to church, not everybody that says, I'm a Christian, not everybody that worships, not everybody that prays, not everybody that prophesies, not everybody that casts demons out based on what the Bible says, is going to be welcomed into that wedding celebration. So the question has to be asked, are we ready to meet Jesus? Are we ready for the second coming of Christ? Are we ready for Christ's return for the bride? Have we been preparing ourselves for our future with him, or have we just been preparing ourselves, preparing ourselves for retirement and nice holidays? How will he find us? How will he find you? How will he find your faith? What will we be doing when he comes? I would encourage you this morning, church, don't grow weary in doing good. Be watchful and fulfill your purpose in Christ. Jesus is our reward. He's coming back to receive us to himself. The contract is complete. We are already married. It's not a matter of if, but when he comes back for his bride. Is everybody tracking? Matthew 24, 12 through 14 says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony for all nations. And then what? And then the end will come. So what is he saying? He's saying, don't stop doing what you're supposed to do. Keep a watchful eye. Make sure that you stay ready. Don't only get ready, but stay ready. Stay ready. Do what I've been calling you to do. Because one day... That last person is going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and then the trumpet is going to sound, and Christ is coming back for his bride. Did you hear me? Until then, we have to prepare ourselves. And the way that we prepare ourselves are with the preparation are with the preparations that he made available to us. What's the third thing that the bride gets in this Jewish traditional wedding? She gets gifts from her husband. I want you to know that you have everything that you need to serve Jesus for the rest of your life. He's given you himself through the expression of the Holy Spirit. Right? Every single one of us if we're saved, if we're born again, if we are the temple of God, then you carry the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Holy Spirit and the power that the Holy Spirit gives you is everything that you need to walk this life in faith till the day that he returns for you. Amen? Come on, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. On one occasion, while he was still eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Come on, I don't know about you, but we need His Holy Spirit to do all that we're supposed to do and be all that we're supposed to be as we wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here's another thing that He, that he instructs us to do that likens to this Jewish wedding. Has anybody ever heard of the cleansing bath or the mikveh? The mikveh is like a, a small pool, almost like a jacuzzi. In fact, in front of the temple, they would have these pools where priests were supposed to go in and bathe themselves or cleanse themselves before they went in before the presence of God. Symbolically, they washed away all the impurities of this earth and they would walk into the presence of God repented, already sacrificed an animal on their behalf and cleansed from all the impurities and the dirt of the, of the world. Likewise, they would also walk into something called a mikveh. In the mikveh, they would also cleanse themselves and wash themselves before they went into the ceremony of marriage. Now, it's interesting because during the time of separation, the bride would partake in a cleansing um, bath in the mikveh. And this is the, name, the same Hebrew word that is used for baptism. To this day, Judaism, in Judaism, the bride cannot marry without the mikveh. The cleansing bath that Christ has provided for his bride during this time of separation is both the baptism of water, where symbolically we die with Christ, we're buried with Christ, and we ri rise again with Christ, and the baptism of fire through the Holy Spirit. This is symbolically the mikveh in a, in a traditional uh, uh, Jewish wedding. And so obviously, the primary significance of the mikveh is not for physical cleansing, it's more of a spiritual cleansing. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus said this, very, very, very truly, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. He said to us in Matthew chapter 28 to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Right? Philip and the eunuch. Right? Philip uh, uh, baptized this eunuch. People were getting baptized symbolically in the mikveh of them being cleansed from all the impurities of this world, dying to their mortal and carnal nature and rising again in the spirit, serving Jesus Christ for the rest of their life. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, or have you forgotten that we are joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? We joined him in his death for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. It's a beautiful, celestial, glorious, heavenly wedding. And we're all invited. All of us who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And it is only through Jesus Christ being a part of the bride of Christ are we allowed to enter into that wedding celebration. Which brings me to my last point, if I could have the worship team come back up. When the, when the groom's father had approved the bridal chambers, he would go get the bride secretly with her bridesmaids. Now, again, this was usually done at night. She didn't know what, what was going to happen and when it was going to happen. But she knew that as soon as she heard the sound of the trumpet, the shofar, she knew that he was on his way. That she needed to prepare herself and get herself ready because here comes the groom. First Thessalonians, Paul, the apostle, writes to the church, he says this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet sound of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be. And so shall we ever or forever be with the Lord. You need to know that as you read the parable of the ten virgins, the Bible says the five are wise and five were foolish. Does it, ever, does it ever get you that it doesn't mention the bride? Have you ever thought about how when he talks about the bridesmaids, the, the ten virgins, that it never mentions the bride? It mentions the bridesmaids, but not the bride. It's interesting. I think it's interesting on, for two main reasons. Number one, because this parable is about the kingdom of God. Matthew 25, 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So it's about eternity, and it's about the return of Jesus. But notice that the virgins represent those who were both wise and foolish. Those that represent, um, it represents those that are accepted into the ceremony and those that are rejected from coming in. And I found that to be really interesting as I studied this portion of Scripture. Because they're all going out to meet the bridegroom. They are not a people who want nothing to do with the bridegroom. They are not a people that want nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, all of them want to be with Jesus when he comes back. But not all of them are ready for his return. Did you hear that? All of them want to be with the groom, but all of them are not ready to be received by the groom. If we're talking about eternity and we're talking about the bridesmaids, that this must be an extension of the bride, right? If this is an extension of the bride, then the bridesmaids are those that are ready to go with the bride to the ceremony, while there are those that are not ready to go to the ceremony because they didn't properly prepare for the reception of the groom. I don't want you to miss the fact, again, that the bride is not mentioned The bridesmaids do represent the bride. The parable is still all about how we're all supposed to watch and be ready for the return of the groom. We should all watch and prepare to meet him. The sad truth is that that everybody is going to be ready for his return. Verse 2, 4. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. For when the foolish, foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wife took flasks of oil with their lamps. I think it's crucial to understand why some were wise and one, while some were foolish. All ten had a job to do. They were all supposed to welcome the bridegroom. That was their job. That was their calling. To be ready. Look at somebody tell them, be ready. That means that at the appointed time, 
when they heard that calling go out, their oil and their lamps were supposed to be burning. Now, if you know anything about the oil in the Bible, it symbolizes the anointing or the Holy Spirit of God on them. Did you hear that? The anointing of God or the Holy Spirit of God on them. But the Bible says that the five foolish ones didn't have any oil. So this would symbolize to me that they didn't have the Holy Spirit of God on them. They had an appointed time to shine, but were incapacitated by their unreadiness to do so. Five of them didn't take their calling seriously, and five of them thought to themselves, if we needed to, at the last minute, at the last second, we can get what we need from somebody else. It's like, really, you had one job, and you took no oil. Everybody had a lamp, and their job was to provide light. Can I just put it in these terms? They had the appearance of being ready, but they had no real fire within them to shine. Their foolishness was to think that they can borrow God's presence and God's power on somebody else's life when they needed it for themselves. Their foolishness was thinking that in the last day, at the last moment, that's when I'll get right with God so that I could be received by God. Until then, I'll do it my way. Their foolishness was thinking that they can borrow somebody else's faith to get them in the doors of the wedding banquet. Look at verse 5. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. And at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And then the foolish ones who knew, they knew they didn't come prepared. They knew they didn't have any oil. They knew that they couldn't light the fire. It was then that they said, give me what you got. And the, the wise ones said, you can't have what we have. It's not ours to give you. We're prepared. You should have come ready. And this is what baffles me. They actually tried to light useless lamps. And then they tried to ask for the impossible. Give me some of your oil. Can I just, can I just say this to some of the kids in the house, some of the young people in the house? You can't go to heaven on your mom and dad's faith. You got to go get your own oil. You can't stay on fire for Jesus on your mom and dad's fire. You got to go get some of your own fire so that you can be ready for the return of Jesus when that day comes. I can't give you what's, what's not mine to give. God pours himself into his holy temple. What the smart virgins are saying is we can't have faith for you and for us. We can't have an inner spiritual life for you and for us. We can't give you obedience and the faithfulness and the use of God-appointed means. So in desperation, the foolish virgins who wasted their lives ran for the impossible instead of having a stay-ready obedience throughout the course of their Christianity. They thought that they would get in on the ceremony with end time obedience. And let me just tell you and warn you right now, don't wait to hear the trumpet to get right with God. Get right and stay right with God today. You see, some people have lamps, but what they have is bad religion. Some people have the form but took care of, no care of what was inside. You may even carry a lamp. You might even keep it shiny, but there's no anointing on it. There's no fire on it. Amen. You need to go get that for yourself. And so I would challenge you this morning to get ready 
to watch, to pray, and prepare, because here comes the groom. He's coming back for his church. Come on. He's coming back for his, for his people, for his chosen. And we don't know what day he's coming back, but he's coming back. If I could just share this last portion of scripture, and then I promise we'll close. Revelations 19, 6 and 9. The Bible says, Then I heard what seemed to be the thunderous voice of a great multitude, like the sound of a massive waterfall and mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt Him and give Him glory, because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, shining bright and clear, has been given her to wear, and the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of his holy believers. Then the angel said to me, Write these words. Wonderfully blessed are those who are invited to the feast at the wedding celebration of the Lamb. And then he said to me, These are the true words of God. Don't just get ready, but stay ready for when Christ comes back for you. Amen? Don't just get ready, but stay ready for when Christ comes back for you. It's so powerful when you look upon this, this wedding feast and the celebration. In fact, other portions of the scripture would say things like, We're, how come, how come uh, nobody showed up to the invitation? He said, well, we invited this person and that person, but this person was so busy with their business and this person was so busy with their schooling and this person was so busy with their kids and this person was so busy with sports and this person was so busy with this, that, and the other. He said none of them would come and God would respond and say to them, go back out onto the streets on the highways and byways and invite them in and tell them about the wedding celebration that the Lamb has come. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the groom to come for the bride. I'm ready for Jesus to come. Amen. And if you didn't already know, he's already here because he's inside of you, working through you and in you and for you. In one glorious day, he's going to come back for all of us. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to the Lord. I would ask, are you ready? Are you ready for the return? Are you ready for him to come back? Man, just don't get ready, but stay ready. Stay ready. I don't know about you, but I want to stay ready. I don't want to be counted with the foolish. I want to be counted with the wise. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to the Lord, if there's anybody here that may not.